Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the Army chooses its next generation squad weapon system. Find out which rifle you'll have in your hands next. Also, a conversation with a legendary Army veteran, one of the first women to graduate from West Point. Plus, more from our recent C4ISRnet conference on the future of networking in the Army. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. First up, the Army closes a years-long process to choose the next rifle for many troops in the force. Options for the next generation squad weapon have been the focus of intense scrutiny for years. Todd South is here with more. So after more than two years of testing and evaluation, the Army finally chose which company is gonna build its next generation squad weapon which is the replacement for the M4 and for the Squad Automatic Weapon, or M249. But actually, you have to rewind a little bit. This project starts essentially in 2017 with a small arms ammunition configuration study. That study really went after challenges that operational forces faced and found out in the field in Afghanistan and other combat scenarios. They were finding limited ranges with the 5.56 round in the M4 and the Squad Automatic Weapon, and they were also having problems with penetration of body armor, especially advanced body armor that was being taken on by adversaries. So what the Army did was take that study, which identified an intermediate caliber, or 6 millimeter. That was later refined to a 6.8 millimeter, which if you're a hunter, you could think of something like a 270 round, a 270 round in more of a larger case though, with more powder behind it to give it more velocity and lethality. That's essentially what they're working with now. So the prototypes came pretty quickly. One from Textron Systems, one from General Dynamics OTS and Lone Star Partnership, and also Sig Sauer, which won the contract for a little more than $4 billion over the next 10 years. Those different prototypes were interesting. The uh, Textron systems had a cased telescope ammunition, essentially a polymer cartridge, with the bullet inside of the cartridge rather than outside to save space and also save weight. The uh, future systems from Lone Star looked at a bullpup design, which is common and has been around for decades, but is not very common in American shooting circles and not with American military. Those two companies did not win the contract, of course. Now, Six Hour also won the contract to replace not just the Army, but the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps' sidearm or handgun back in 2017. That's the 9mm weapon that's gonna, that actually replaced the Beretta M9, which had been in service since the 1980s. So with this program with the Next Generation Squad weapon, soldiers, Marines, Special Operations all tested this weapon. They gave their feedback on all three prototypes, and then the Army, of course, selected the Six Hour version. Now in January, before the weapon was actually announced, the Army selected the Fire Controller Optic for about a $2.7 billion contract that was gonna essentially field these optics with all of the weapons moving forward for the next 10 years. The two items together basically create a whole new way of shooting. The Fire Control Optic has built-in invisible and visible laser range finders, uh, aiming lasers, a suite of sensors for atmospheric conditions, ballistic computers and calculators. The Fire Control can actually be mounted on any weapon within the arsenal, on machine guns, on the existing M4 platform, and of course on the next generation squad weapon, which it was built specifically for. Of course, the weapon, the uh, rifle version of the next generation squad weapon will replace the M4 and M16 for the close combat forces. The Automatic rifle version, or M250, will re replace the M249 SAW squad automatic weapon. Now, both the M16 M4 and the SAW were firing the 5.56. Both of the variants for the next generation squad weapon will fire the 6.8 millimeter. Again, I said it was for the close combat forces. That's essentially infantry, scouts, combat medics, combat engineers, and of course, special operations forces, and potentially some marine units. Now, the Marines have not decided officially to adopt the program and bring those rifles into fielding. However, the contract allows for enough rifles to be produced for all of the services if they need it. Right now, the Army plans to have about 120,000 over the next 10 years. Those quantities may change, and the delivery dates may change depending on budgets from Congress, but they're going to field that out to every one of the close combat forces within the, in the Army. However, the contract over that decade does allow for 
the building and manufacturing of up to 250,000 weapons, which would fill all the needs of the Marine Corps Close Combat Forces, Special Operations or SOCOM, and even foreign partners should they decide to buy the weapon. Now, the first batch of these weapons are supposed to hit the first unit equipped, which has not yet been identified, by fall of 2023. Now, don't get excited yet, soldiers. That's not going to hit every soldier in the Army immediately, and not even large-scale units. It could take many years, even up to potentially a decade, to fully field out all these weapons, to build them, um, put them out, to, and, and get, get them through testing and fielding to the different units across the Army for the full 120,000 complement that would actually serve the entire close combat force. In the meantime, the Army has to create a whole new ammunition line. Um, essentially, Sig Sauer, the company that won the, the competition, which was built really around an Army-produced, government-produced projectile, the 6.8mm projectile, is going to have to work with the Army to adjust you know, pressures, ballistics, different kinds of ratios on that round to get it really right there in the sweet spot of, of target accuracy and lethality. And to do that, Six Hour is basically devoting an entire production line to producing that round for the next two to three years. And then while they're doing that, the Army and the DOD, the Pentagon, are funding a whole new line, a whole new building for ammunition production just for 6.8 millimeter at its Lake City Ammunition Plant. That's the plant that produces pretty much all of the small arms ammunition across the Army and for most of the services that fire small arms. So those two kind of parallel projects are going to be going on, building the weapon, building enough rounds to produce what's called a war stock or enough to go to war with, as well as enough to train with for those first few batches of weapons, and also building out a production line that can keep pumping out as many rounds as needed in the millions, hundreds of millions really, over the coming years. So there's a huge stockpile of ammunition for the close combat force to fight with should it come to that. This is Todd South with Military Times. Thanks, Todd. And in headlines from around the military, an Army Texas Guard soldier died recently after he was washed away while helping save drowning migrants who were trying to cross the Rio Grande. 22-year-old specialist Bishop E. Evans was reported missing last week. And though he removed his body armor before entering the river, he did not resurface. State officials said he drowned after attempting to rescue two migrants. He was assigned to Operation Lone Star, Texas Governor Greg Abbott's border initiative. Military Space Aid travel is back after a two-year pause for the COVID-19 pandemic. Space Aid allows eligible travelers to fly on military or military contracted flights at little or no cost if space allows. And though a federal judge has struck down the mask mandate for airplane travel, the mask requirement will continue on military aircraft and terminals until further notice. And the Marine Corps has just declared its new heavy lift helicopter operational, following completion of its test, training, and sustainment requirements. Deputy Commandant for Aviation Lieutenant General Mark Wise determined on Friday that the CH-53K King Stallion had achieved this milestone. While a much stronger and improved helicopter than its predecessor, the King Stallion was previously expected to reach initial operations in late 2019 or early 2020. And in Pentagon headlines, the Department of Defense Inspector General said the Army has failed to get enough soldier input in developing its augmented reality goggle system. An IG report said the service risked, quote, wasting up to $21.9 billion in taxpayer funds to field a system that soldiers may not want to use or use as intended. The goggles are intended to give troops broadly expanded vision capabilities, including thermal day sights, night vision, navigation, and target acquisition. And the U.S. commander responsible for North American defense said he's looking for new ways to counter cruise missile attacks on the homeland. Air Force General Glenn Van Herc, who leads the Northern Command and North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, said he's looking at new countermeasures, including electronic warfare and other non-kinetic means. Van Herc wasn't specific, but the Missile Defense Agency has previously explored using space-based lasers to intercept ballistic missiles, while the Navy is looking at electronic attack capabilities to disrupt them. And finally, the U.S. pledged nearly another $400 million in military aid to Ukraine. Following a trip by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Secretary of State Antony Blinken to Kyiv recently, officials said they would give indirect aid to the country by reimbursing allied nations for weapons and hardware sent to Ukraine. The country is now in its second month of defending itself against an invasion by Russia. And that's it for your headlines this week. 
When we come back, how will the Army take advantage of 5G or future G when it comes to moving data in coming years? Up next, how will the Army take advantage of 5G or future G when it comes to moving data in coming years? Top Army officials discussed the topic in our recent C4ISRNet conference. Have a look. You know, as you start to look at man-to-man uh, -man teaming in some of the robotic areas, you know, 5G has got a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, to allow for that type of connectivity. We even look at one of the areas we haven't talked about is the aerial layer. And we start to thicken the network, not just in the terrestrial, not just space, but also in the air. And as, as General Ray mentioned too, um, within space, there's a lot of opportunity there. However, at the same token, you know, 5G has got, you know, when it comes, there's got some sensitivities when it comes to foliage, uh, blockage and other activities. So I, I think once again, that is just another area where, um, you know, it's going to be uh, another layer of connectivity that we can afford uh, and provide. I think it's going to have a lot of contributions, um, as well as I know within the department, we're starting to look at, you know, a, you know, a rollout in various tranches, starting at, even at our installations and then moving down to our tactical environment. But as you start to look at some of the future demands uh, for information, um, you know, when you get into future battle space, 5G is going to have a, a tremendous opportunity and the ability to transport some of the information at a much quicker pace uh, and at, at a much uh, higher throughput. And dispersing the formation is going to be critical in the future. And I mean, you can watch the ongoing operations. We'll use that as an example. Dispersing of our forces will be important. And I think 5G plays a big role in that uh, going forward, both uh, at terrestrial and at, at the uh, space layer, I think is going to be the key across the board. And we, we have a follow-up question from our audience. Uh, this person asks, what types of communication systems will be used in JADC2? Will they include 5G, 6G, cognitive radio, etc.? And what will be the primary types of communication systems that will serve as that JADC2 backbone? So I think the answer is yes. yes. I think it's all, all, the above. <laughs> all the above. We, we, want, uh, we, 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 we really are looking toward a future that's got, you know, multi-layer, multi-function, uh, multi-band uh, capability. And I, and I think one of the things that we're trying to embrace, and, and we'll never be able to forecast, you know, all these future opportunities, but one of the areas that General Ray and I spend a fair amount of time is, you know, what, what is the open systems architecture? And this is where we, you know, we, we look to industry to help, um, you know, how can we have not just an open architecture, but a, a, but a common open systems architecture. In fact, one of the initiatives that we've been working closely with uh, Air Force and, and the Navy is on uh, the SOSA consortium. It's an open systems architecture consortium for a lot of transport initiatives. And this is where we get to a, something as simple as an open chassis uh, that's got various card slots. Uh, I can slide in a card for position navigation timing. I can slide in a card for um, electronic warfare or basic communications, be it uh, space, be it ground. Uh, and all of this is defined uh, not through mil specs, but through uh, joint agreed to standards between both uh, government and through industry. Um, and that way we can have a, you know, a modular and open system. And that really affords us the opportunity not just to keep pace with technology and all some of the things that you mentioned, but the adversary is evolving rapidly too as well. And so we have to continue both from a technology perspective and keeping pace with the threat. But I really think uh, our investments and our time to have a framework of a common uh, open systems architecture, I think it holds true, uh, not only in some of the traditional transport uh, items that you mentioned, but I think also in the data fabric. We're similarly trying to lay out a data fabric that has a open systems architecture of a set of Lego building blocks uh, and then we can continue to evolve and, and not be beholden to a singular uh, monolithic capability, but something that can evolve and, and keep, pace, keep pace with technology and threat uh, and evolve much more at a much quicker pace than it has in the past. Yeah, so coming out of Project Convergence uh, 21, one, you know, one of our premier exercise, uh, experimentation uh, events that we, we hold, it really focuses on how do we, how do we get after JADC2 and coming out of that, 
one of the key things we focused on was the data fabric. So that's one of the bookends that I believe is important in order to uh, achieve sensor to shooter. The other bookend that I believe is important for JADC2 is uh, getting the mission partner environment correct. If we get those two correct across the board, I think those are the bookends that, that is gonna make JADC2 realized across the board. Uh, so PC22 is gonna focus more on uh, data sharing, is going to focus on operational synchronization and then some integration with our joint and coalition partners across the board, looking at that mission partner environment and how we share information across the board, sensor to shooter data as well. When we come back, how inflation affects you and what to watch for as the government tries to keep it in check. Welcome back. The Federal Reserve is taking steps to keep consumer prices from spiraling out of control. Personal finance expert Jeanette Mack explains how on this week's edition of Money Minutes. With inflation taking a bigger bite out of your paycheck in recent months, the Federal Reserve has and will continue to take steps to prevent consumer prices from spiraling out of control. While they have a few tools at their disposal, none are more impactful than their ability to influence interest rates. Rising interest rates affect a lot of the rates offered by your bank or credit union, and borrowers and savers alike will notice the changes. So if you're one of the millions of Americans looking for a loan or a savings product, listen up, because small increases make a big difference. For example, mortgage rates are rising, even for VA-eligible borrowers. So a 1% increase on a 30-year fixed $300,000 mortgage loan will increase your monthly payment by almost $200, taxes and fees excluded. So while mortgage rates were at record lows for years and are still below the historical average, the potential for locking in a lower rate is huge. And the good news is savings, checking, and money market account rates are also expected to rise. While no one knows the economy's future or how many times the Fed will raise rates, the writing is on the wall. Plan your finances today to reap the rewards in the future. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. For more up-to-date coverage of the military and defense spaces, check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com and DefenseNews.com. And to get a list of vital stories in your inbox every weekday morning, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. Also, if you haven't done it already, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And when we come back, a talk with a legendary Army veteran. Carol Barkalo is a legendary Army veteran who was in the first class of women ever to graduate from the United States Military Academy. Recently inducted into the Army Women's Hall of Fame, Barkalo spoke to Defense News Weekly about her time at West Point and how the military has advanced since she was in uniform. My name is Carol Barkalo. I am a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Army. I spent 22 years and some change in the Army. Well, when we, we entered the academy, I truly had no idea what I was in for. And again, I grew up with three older brothers, so I figured I survived all their tortures. I could handle anything. There were other cadets who had a different idea of acceptance. And I will tell you that every cadet, their first year, got hazed. Um, and so sometimes it was hard to discern the difference between being hazed because I was a woman or being hazed because I was a cadet. And uh, there were some times where upperclassmen, we had to greet upperclassmen as we walked to class, we were in the hallways, and some would respond, you know, good morning, bitch. That was true. It happened. So you knew immediately that it was because I was a woman. Uh, upper class had the, the, the right to stop a plebe, fourth class cadet, anytime they wanted. And so they had a lot of control over us with not a lot of oversight from the officers at West Point. So sometimes it was pretty tough. There were women upper class <clears throat> in my class who didn't want to look like we were weak. And so with that, they picked on some of the then coming in freshman women. And 
you know, that was tough. That was tough on those women. But as we went through, I realized that every person there was slaying their own dragon and that stress was different and hard for everyone going through it. So a lot of times what I did, and I played basketball there and I played team handball, and I spent a lot of time with the underclassmen trying to help them through what they were going through as a plebe. The thing for me about um, having a military commander be taken out of uh, the chain of command to uh, adjudicate a case is tough because I know if I was there, I would want to adjudicate that case. But not all men are able to see different sides of a story. Sometimes it's tough when you haven't felt it, you don't know how to react to it. And I understand that. You know, and I've always said that, have I been discriminated against? Absolutely. Have I been sexually harassed? Absolutely. But what I said was, two things can happen. I can take it, or I can start their education that day. And for me, I've been able to start their education that day. And as long as we continue to see that if a commander shows some prejudice, then it needs to be taken to a different level. And it's pretty tough if it's the commander in the chain of command that's the problem. And many women, especially young enlisted women, do not feel comfortable or that they're going to be heard going to even a higher rank. So it's a work in progress. The Army has changed quite a bit since I've been in. And I guess I could use the, the, the saying, progress, not perfection, uh, because it will never be perfect. However, it has gotten better because there are men who understand and there are women who are in leadership positions who understand what young women in the military sometimes face. And they still face prejudice and discrimination. The key is when it is brought up, that it is looked at individually and taken care of. Um, the tough thing, I think, is kind of putting all women and the situation in one bag. No two situations are alike. So a woman who has claimed sexual harassment against her boss um, is different from another woman who's claimed sexual harassment from her boss. And the key is not to lump them together. The key is for the leadership to take each individual case because we don't do this with men. And so if we can look at that and, and keep understanding that we are all individuals, I will tell you that maybe even today, but to a lesser extent, when a man reports to a unit, he's strong until proven weak. When a woman reports to a unit, she's weak until proven strong. And I would tell you that that's for all the minorities. And what's tough is if you come in after a woman has been there in your position, what they do is they measure you against that woman before you, but they don't do that to white men. They grade those men on what they do or not do. So if we have just uh, an understanding that that's something that happens and we acknowledge it, you know, I think once, the key is everybody's prejudice. Once you acknowledge that prejudice, for me, it's the only way you can step back, get rid of that prejudice, and look at the equity in the system. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.